seems like recently that much of the news we have been receiving about the health of the church in the United States, in the West in general, has been bad news. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we've got to just uh, look at things like the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so on this episode of Life Talks, we're going to be talking about the decline of the Western Church. My name is Dan. I'm with Ben. We're the teaching pastors at Life Fellowship in Charlotte, North Carolina. Ben, every time I get an email from you lately that has an article for me to read, it's like, people quit reading their Bibles during COVID. People aren't coming to church as much during COVID. More churches are closing than opening because of, you know. So do you have any good news I'm do, for us? I'm doing that because I'm just... I just love to br- brighten up your day in, in your in your yeah, inbox. I'm, I'm the pessimist. You're the you're the ever loving optimist. So it I, must really be bad news. Well, I think I'm doing that because I think we feel something. Mm-hmm. We feel like man, something is not right. We feel that that we're heading in the wrong direction as a country. We're feeling like we're heading in a wrong direction morally. And I think if you're involved with the church, we feel the same same progressive energy the momentum is leading away from the church growth yeah we i mean i've heard it described as you know we're in a culture shift <clears throat> if you've ever been in an earthquake zone you know that there's there's uh the minor earthquakes you know the tremors yeah um and sometimes you, until you're well into the earthquake you don't know whether this is going to be a five pointer or a six pointer right. or a 6.2 it, it feels like we're in the beginning stages of an earthquake a cultural shift yeah. that impacts the church christianity the the popular culture and we just don't know how long this is going to continue shaking and what the consequences are going to be long term yeah i mean and, and the reality is it's important for us to understand that if we, if you pretend, if you put your blinders on and just pretend, let's just keep doing church as normal. Let's just keep doing whatever we've been doing. Um, I think that you're not going to be prepared for some of the these massive shifts that are happening. And so, I, what I'm not okay when I say that, what I'm not saying is, you know, we need to change our theology or right. or leave the Bible behind. Um, the the word of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ never changes, and we mm-hmm. should never ever leave that behind. Right. But I do think that there are things for us to to awaken and say, okay, if God, if if the gospel does have power and the spirit of God can move, can move in people's hearts to create a movement of God, like mm-hmm. what, what is going on that we are seeing the actual digression of the church as opposed to the advancement of the church? Yeah. So I, that's, the, that's what I'm wrestling with yeah, right now. And I think as we start the conversation, it's really important. I mean, you and I both have come from a theological perspective. And this is something, actually, you've, you've been very good with me in, in being my pastor over the years. Is we're, we're big on the sovereignty of God. So in other words, this isn't catching God by surprise, and we are confident that in the midst of this shift, God is very active. He's very much at work. He is permitting things. He's revealing things. He's purifying things. So when we talk about this, we're not really talking about it from a, oh my goodness, Christianity is going to end, but rather it is God is is shuffling the deck, so to speak, a little bit and, and revealing some things that we need to be aware of. Let's see where God is working and why he's working and joining minute. Yes. So as as you as you're sifting through this, mm. you know, this data that's coming through and so forth, what are what are some trends that you think are noteworthy for us to to, to be aware of? Well, I I think the first <clears throat> the first trend that I saw that the article, I remember one of the articles I sent to you was uh this article that Barna had done about how many churches are closing every year and how many churches are opening every year. Mm-hmm. And the reality is it's the number of churches that are shutting down every year is somewhere around the number about 5,000. Mm. And the number of churches that are starting every year is around 3,000. Now, this those most recent statistics were pre-COVID. Mm. So we have no idea what the disruption of COVID created for churches closing, churches starting. Because I, I know for a fact... Before COVID, I remember there was a group of about 12 church planters that were planting in Charlotte during uh, the, the beginning of 2020. And when 2020 hit, I th- I only I believe there's only one or two of those churches that actually came through and planted during that out of that group of 12. Uh, so that's just that's just um, personal knowledge. It's an mm-hmm. example of I, be, I guarantee you a lot of church plants that started, you know, 2019, 2020 either got delayed or shut down immediately. So those numbers that we have seen might even be worse off today than they were even three years ago uh, in 2019 when this study was was happening. But but the reality is we that's a net loss. 
mm-hmm. right? This is a net loss of between 1,500 and 2,000 churches every single year. And to me, when that's when that's happening, man, that's that's pretty serious because there's right around 300,000 churches in North America, and that's all denominations. I mean, it's right. like it's every church. And uh, the, the median church size is something like 65 people. So mm-hmm. it's not like it's a ton of, you know, people, but, but it's, man, when you lose 2000 churches a year, every year, that's, that's close to about one, 1%. It, it eventually is going to come to the point where, um, the, we're going in the wrong direction, yeah. plain, plain, plain and simple. Yeah. And you, and you look at the, again, the net loss, uh, realizing that some of these churches probably needed to close. And some yes. of these churches were not necessarily gospel centric. Yes, um, yes. Uh, because we we have seen over the years a dramatic decline in the mainstream denominations. That's correct. And many of those have abandoned any pretense of being gospel centric. Yes. Uh, yeah. a long time ago. Um, but but yeah, we live in a post COVID world where we you know the dust has not settled yet. Yeah. Um, be, beyond just places to go that call themselves churches, though, we're we're seeing things like less frequent attendance. We're seeing mm. things like less engagement with the Bible. Yeah. Uh, what does that pretend uh, for, for our future? Well, I just think that that the church has to ask themselves, what 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 do we need to do to go back to, to, the, to, to Jesus and say, God, you've got to rescue this church? There has to be, Dan, there has to be a level of desperation. Hmm. I, I think you and I are old enough to, to remember certain movements and certain trends within the evangelical church. And the, the trend that I grew up in the formative years of my life, that I was kind of coming into Bible college, and I would say the first 15 years of my ministry experience was this belief that the church was declining in, in North America, but what the church needed if the church was going to recapture the the energy and the vibrancy and 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 have a movement of God again, we have got to be relevant, hmm. right? Right. And yeah, it, you, on that. You, you, that, there's a massive relevance conversation. The idea was, listen, you try to do things in a church setting that just feel old and stale, like you're doing church in 1930, and and we need to contextualize doing church generationally and culturally. And there's nothing wrong with contextualization, but I think that. I mean, we heard that drum beat forever, and we saw churches grow when they would contextualize, you know, more contemporary music, uh, more more type of teaching that would that was more mo- you know, quote unquote, modern. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Introduction of technology, yeah, yeah, like all of these kinds of things that we thought this is bringing church more in a more relevant and more modern way for people to still enjoy God, uh, worship God, but not deal the old stodgy way of 1950s. Well. I think the lie that we believed was relevance was the key to changing, shifting. But what what re, what the relevant church did now that we can look back on it, thirty years, um, thirty and forty years in, in the past, what we can see is what the what the movement of relevance did was it took people out of old stodgy churches and put them in contemporary churches, but it made no significant decrease in the lostness of of America. Mm-hmm. So what it did was it put it put more people in quote unquote healthier churches, but it did not reach people and teach people how to reach their neighbors and how to live as missionary disciples where they lived. And so that that to me was, you know, we're waking up and we're seeing these trends that we've done and these beliefs that we had and hey, if you do this, you'll grow your church. But what we found is we're looking at the data now. We we have grown massive churches. Um, but what we have not done is reach the lost. Hmm. And that is a that's a damning statement for hmm. the North American church. So we believed, hey, if we're relevant, then that's going to help us grow. And what it did is it did help you grow. It helped you reach Christians who really wanted to have that kind of environment. Um, but here's the problem we face today. Um, 30, 40 years ago, we we're dealing with a, a you know somewhat Christian worldview generation. We talked about this on the last mm-hmm. episode with the Bible conversation. Well, the church is no longer re- the Bible's no law. Lo- when you talk about relevancy, mm-hmm. the, the relevancy for millennials and Gen Zers, they're not thinking, "Man, I should really go back to church." Or if the church was just more relevant, I would go to it. Like they're not even thinking about church. So I think there is a 
the relevance argument, what happens when in order to be relevant, you have to compromise biblical standards on things like sexuality, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the, that's the danger of making relevance the core of, of your belief of what's going to help you reach people. And in the view of many people, the church is a, is a, um, uh, a block to <clears throat> the cultural revolution that they believe that we should have, yeah. whether it is, you know, changing things like gender identity and, and sexual expression and yes. all these different things. So the, one of the few remaining uh, impediments to what they would see as progress, thus the term progressive, mm-hmm. um, is the church. And, and we've, we've moved from a proactive stance to a reactive stance, I'm, yeah. I'm afraid, in the church. And as, as such, we're kind of on our heels. The, the interesting thing, though, for me, for me is, you know, you look back and, and, you know, from a global perspective, there are parts of the world where the church is growing. It is Thriving. exploding. Yes. Central and South America, uh, in parts of the Middle East where there yes. was previously no revival. In some sections of Africa, there's signs of a yes. spiritual awakening. And then even, you know, in, in Asia. China and yeah. Asia mm-hmm. and, and different places. Uh, Europe, it's still declining. In the West, it's declining yes. in terms of the, the North American continent. But, but so... What? Why is it expanding in other places and in, in ours? It's a, a retract. I, I think that there's. I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I do think that 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 our our um. I think our socioeconomic level. It's it's just a. Even Jesus talked about how the wealthier you are, the harder it is to mm-hmm. to accept him. Mm-hmm. Right? It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter, enter into heaven. And again, it's not saying that if people are wealthy that they can't accept Jesus. It's just when there's no desperation of man, what are we going to eat today, mm-hmm. or how do I take care of the? It, you know, it feels like a lot of times in America we can take we do pretty well on our own without having to mm-hmm. reach out, quote unquote, to God. Now that's not true. But it feels that way many times. And so th- I think there's a lot of lies that we believe that, you know, I need God for the big things, but I don't need God for the little things. And when you don't have that desperation like people do in places where they're, they are in a communist country or they're in a socialist country or, or they, they need God to God provide food for my family today, it changes what you really think you need mm-hmm. and and you changes the way you cry out to God and I think that's just a that's a big part of it um so I think there's there's a there, there's the, the wealth of of the western civilization has been in some ways a detriment but at the same time we could also see how it was really the christian worldview that built the wealth mm-hmm. you know what i mean but but i i do think there you see these declining values over time and just a couple other things i'll share with you that we see not only do we see churches closing here's something i found interesting um in 1992 the average age of uh the a pastor was 44 years old Hmm. in 1992 today 30 years later do you know what it is 57 interesting so in which which interestingly almost matches my I was yeah yes I was forty three in yes, uh, yeah. yes, nineteen ninety two yes. yeah. yeah so so it's gone in thirty years yeah. the average age has gone up twenty three years which means this this is a really uh, scary statement to understand like who are the new church leaders in twenty years yeah because if the media if the if the average church age is fifty seven in twenty years who's going to be leading the churches yeah. and that, that's a that's a that's a that's a crisis that we're facing right now, and the pools that which, um, you know, there was this resurgence of church planting right when I did it back in two thousand six. Do you remember mm-hmm. when we oh, planted? Sure. Yeah. Um, right around the mid two thousands to the mid two two thousand teens, uh, for about ten years, there was a massive resurgence of church planting in North America. Um, Southern Baptist, Acts twenty nine, mm-hmm. a lot of denominations. I mean, there were huge conferences, exponential. ARC. Uh, it was like, you know, 5,000 church planters a year would show up. I mean, it was a a mini movement that you mm-hmm. saw. And a lot of the people that were planting churches, you know where they were? They were young guys who had, who had been youth pastors. They were young guys who were coming out of seminary. Or they're young guys who are in a parachurch ministry like Young Life or, or FCA or something like that. Well, even those pools that, they, that church planting drew from, most of them have dried up right now. Mm. We're not seeing the same amount of youth pastors going into church planting. We're not seeing, you know, seminaries. Most seminaries right now are drying up. There's only a, a couple seminaries that are actually 
growing and thriving. Yeah, we just saw Gordon Conwell announced last uh, or yesterday they were selling their main campus in Massachusetts. I don't even know if you've seen you, that. Yet. You're kidding? Yeah, me. the main campus in Massachusetts of Gordon Conwell, Center. which is a historic yeah, seminary yeah. in in our country. So I mean, it's it's fascinating when you think about uh, even the seminary I I'm Bible college I went to. It's very small. I mean, they've had to sell buildings and it's, shr- it's shrunk down a lot. The the pools by which people have drawn out of church leadership or church planting, those things are are eroding. So we have to be creative of thinking of new ways. How do we engage the next generation to want to even do this? Mm-hmm. Right. So you have this you have this drying up of of leadership. You have the aging leadership. But I think the other thing that is really important that we have to speak to, speak to this is this. Um, there's a death to institutional loyalty. Mm-hmm. That is very prominent amongst the younger generations. They don't. They don't follow teams. They follow. They follow players. Like like for you and me, we choose. When we were younger, we chose a team and we stuck with that team, whether they stunk or mm-hmm. whether they were great. That's my team, and I'm I'm going to cheer for them. This younger generation, it's like I like Patrick Mahomes, mm-hmm. right? Or I like I like this player yeah. on this team. It has it has no. The loyalty to the team is not existent. It's loyalty. To, I like this player, so therefore I'll wear his jersey. I'll cheer for the team he's on. But if he changes teams, I'm following the player. Yeah. Right. And so, what you and I think so differently compared to the other generation. When you think about, hey, come be a part of our local church. They're not thinking, I'm going to join this church to be a part of this church family. What they're th- what they're going to join is they're going to join. They're, they're going to partner with pastors that they like or partner with. That's or I'm not even, saying it's right or wrong. I'm yeah, just saying that's the reality. It's totally happening, and it's also happening with non-pastors because you've got the Lisa Turkhursts and, and, yes. the, and the female bloggers yeah. that have uh, yeah. the Beth Moores, yeah. um, who who have, and it is part of the cult of celebrity that that has. And you know, I can't help but think as as you were talking, you know, so much of the '80s church growth movement revolved around attraction. Yes. So we adopted an attractional model. Uh, whether we wanted to call it seeker sensitive or seeker driven or all the different terms, but it it be, it is it has become so part of church planting culture and church culture. Um, what we did not realize is that the attractional model feeds consumerism. Yeah. And you add to that, as you just mentioned, our tendency to follow gurus and celebrities, and then look at the massive number of the gurus and celebrities who have fallen. Oh, or who yeah. have been revealed to be frauds, yes. or who have, who have, you know, abandoned, deconstructed, yeah. and and, uh, and 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 so no wonder we're we're a mess, we're yeah. confused. In light of all that, how do we start a recovery? Yeah, and I think we, because we only have a few minutes, I think maybe we take that to, to the to the next episode. But I do think that if you don't understand what's wrong, you can't fix it. And I think that um, what 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 I would encourage. you, Older people who might be hearing this, and maybe old, maybe more mature people. I'm learning how to say mature or mature for Dan. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, is don't don't look at things and sometimes we can uh, we can long we can yearn for the older days. Oh man, when I was a kid, this is the way it was, and this is you know. Well, guess what? In 2020, this is our reality. Mm-hmm. And what I would say to those of you who remember when times were better, um, I guarantee you this: if you went to, to 1984 and you talk to you know you know what they would say the same well when i was a kid this is the way mm-hmm. and they would the very trends that were going on in their nation or going on in the church or the country they would feel like everything's going to hell in a handbasket and yep. so every every older generation feels like this what i would it say to the older generation is don't lose hope and don't lose faith because even though the, we see these trends and we see this reality god is still on the throne and and he is still in charge and he I don't know. There, there's no. There's no guarantee that the trends that are happening are going to continue that way. Yeah. God can do anything. You well, know. Well, and 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 that's where I would add to that as well to the younger generation, those of you who are listening to podcasts. Yeah. Because the old guys are yeah. going to listen to podcasts, right? But uh, step up to the plate. Exactly. Work your way to the front of the line. Yeah. Take a hold of the leadership. 
uh, swing for swing for the the stands. Um, we need a generation of fresh thinkers and of innovative, creative people. But more than that, we need some people who are deeply in love with the Savior and and thoroughly committed to to truth and the authenticity of Scripture and the mission of the gospel. To you know, I've got maybe ten years left, and and. And, and, and then I'll probably be watching from the grandstands of heaven. <laughs> Stop um, it, Dan. But we, <laughs> and that's why I love spending time with the 20 somethings yeah, yeah. because these are the new, this is the new wave. Yeah. But, but, and I think it's important for my generation and, and your generation as it becomes my generation is that we've got to be the cheerleaders for this next yeah. generation. And we've got to warn them about the stupid things that we bought into. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I think the, what I would also say to the younger generation is sometimes they have this. Per- perception of well this older they, they screwed everything up yeah and they opt out as opposed to saying no no, no. come be a part of the movement again mm-hmm. like this we want we're, we're more interested in just changing the institution we're interested in seeing a movement of god and mm-hmm. if the church can stay on that message which is true i mean that's the message of jesus that man we want to make we're not interested in just growing a brand that's mm-hmm. the biggest younger generations when they hear that are like opting out. Mm-hmm. I want to be as part of something that's bigger than just your thing. Yeah. And that's what we've got to remind ourselves at Life Fellowship is to say we're what we're concerned about more than anything else is not increasing Life Fellowship. It's increasing the name of Jesus and the glory of God and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like that is a thing that we're going to we're going to be going after. And so um I think we need to remind the younger generation don't opt out because you might see the institutions feel like they're so broken. Yeah. If you want a reason to, to quit God, quit church, and, uh, and 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 to quit being part of what God is doing, Satan will always give you reason. Yeah. He will always provide one for you. Yeah. But we we would issue the call uh, to, the, to the next generation and to our generation is to finish well and to get into the fight because it is certainly worth fighting. We're going to be talking about that fight a little bit more in our next episode of Life Talks. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.